So, Victor, uh, are you going to be dropping out of your PhD to go and teach at the University of Austin? I was I heard actually that they're opening up. <laughs> Steven you know what? Baker's already jumping ship, and you know if it's too moronic for him, it's just got to be the most moronic thing on this continent. He dropped out of what? The University of Austin or the other he, thing? He, no, he was an advisor, I think. When he dropped out. A yeah. fucking, just like the collection of just massive substack morons. I didn't see that. I didn't see that he dropped out, but I was actually thinking, you know, if I can't get a job anywhere, you know, I'll go teach at the University of Austin. No problem. No I don't problem. know if this was real or not, but I saw a tweet that said they had like 5,000 applicants for jobs. <laughs> that's not surprising to me. No, that's not surprising at all. <laughs> so I'm on the website and beginning summer 2022 is... The Forbidden Courses. Mm. Yeah, I, I could see I could see Michael Millerman uh, getting a job there. I feel like he'd be well suited. What, what What do you think the Forbidden yeah. Courses are? Like there are only two genders, or something, or like or like manliness. Probably one on Man. the bell curve at the very least. Like uh, manliness, the bell curve. Yeah, like like the truth about the truth about genetic differences among among, among ethnic groups. Yeah. Is Christianity really uh, better than Islam? Answer: Yes. No. Yeah. No, their, yeah. their gender studies institute is just like alpha, beta, gamma, omega, sigma. <laughs> they'll, tr they'll, they'll teach like, um, yeah, Harvey Mansfield's book, Manliness. Um, it'll you be see, like a whole course on manliness. You see their website? It's just like the School of Athens by Raphael. And oh, yeah. Com committed they to much truth. Cheesy? I, they have yeah. this like uh, fantasy. What's that Robin Williams movie where he, he teaches them in the, in the cave? Oh, Dead Poet Society? Yeah, he, this is like Dead Poet Society for, <laughs> for people who have been canceled. Mm, yeah, you should probably tell Eric that we started recording already, so he'll, he should start oh, recording. Hey, Eric, we're recording. Um, yeah, no, I want to. Uh, I want to teach there. I'm excited about it. You know, it's going to be a, 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 you know, a haven of uh, real critical thought. So, you know, I can't wait. It's fantastic. I mean, are you white enough? By the to time teach you there get back, all? you're going to be such a fucking alpha that none mm. of us will even be able to like stand your presence. Uh, the sheer manliness that you'll exude will be exhausting for all the rest of us betas. I know. The, you know, I, in all the, in, on a serious note, though, I do some like there's a part of me, though, that I'm like the kind of like uh, the dismissive snobby response to it that we're having that we're all enjoying right now. Uh, <laughs> at the same time, like I feel a little bit like ah, who also like who gives a fuck? Like let them let them do their stupid little thing. And whatever. well, they should have just called it Safe Space University since that's exactly what it is. No, sorry. Sorry. Safe Space University asterisk. Not actually an accredited university. Basically, yeah. Did I ever tell you one of the funniest things uh, I ever encountered when I wrote those articles for Colette? You know Colette, like the Right Wing magazine? Yeah, yeah. So I wrote these articles because I really wanted to kind of broach left wing ideas to a right wing audience and also just to see if I could do it. Like, could I con successfully convert a few people? Uh, which I did, by the way, which is nice. And I got emails about that. But like the number of people who would post about things I wrote endorsing Marissa Rawls being like, this is supposed to be an IDW place. We're not supposed to be exposed to this kind of thinking here. Uh, I don't understand why it's contaminating my perfect magazine. Uh, and every single time somebody did this, I would just retweet. So you want a safe space <laughs> to explore <laughs> no. your ideas without the possibility of them being contaminated by anything that might actually make you think differently about your positions. Uh, because I have a lot of people on the other end of the political spectrum that I can introduce you to who can help you out with that. Well, yeah. we yeah, learned yeah, long yeah. ago that any claims for intellectual or argumentative consistency by the intellectual dad web will be shouted down by an army of overly emotional 20-year-old Sigma males before they land. Anyway, we should, uh, we should get to the meat and potatoes. All right. What did we talk about last week? Uh, I mean, was we there anything we didn't talk about? We covered a lot. New, new consciousness. Oh, it was uh, Merleau Ponty's critiques of intellectualism and uh, empiricism, mainly. Yeah, that was good stuff. And these were these were some interesting passages. But yeah, go ahead and explain them. All right. So today, um, a, a lot of kind of our, our, our initial approach to this, we're talking about Merleau Ponty's phenomenology of perception. Um, this is our fifth bit of content on it because I did two videos on it over on the uh, Patreon. If you want to see what we read today, even if you're not a, a, a patron, you can find this post and I'll attach the links to the sections underneath that if you want to read 
what we read. Anyway, this is PillPod 60-something, and it's our actually 109th episode total, it's wow. estimated. Wow. So um, this sounds a lot like navel-gazing in some cases, where we're just paying attention to attention itself, paying attention to human experience itself. And what could be misinterpreted there or get lost there is that we are actually, or that Merleau-Ponty was a Marxist and he had uh, views of human history and views of class consciousness that are not Marxist specifically, not like uh, Orthodox Marxist, but they are phenomenological. And as a Marxist, he gave a phenomenological explanation or account of what revolution could look like. And that's what we read today. So we're, we, we took some weeks off of politics, and now we're reintroducing a political episode, but via phenomenology, which is not honestly the way we usually talk about uh, politics. But I got to say, this, this guy just fucking keeps nailing it over and over again. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, this is a uh... This is really good stuff. We're kind of jumping all over the place. Like we kind of skipped some stuff to get to the Marxist and hopefully we'll be able to go back to some of the the other stuff. I guess you were saying we're just taking a little break from the non-polit politics to get back into a little politics. Yeah, just just so that we're not navel gazing, you know, because a lot of it seems like navel gazing. I think next week we'll talk about poor old Schneider. Did you um, get did you get <laughs> navel gazing? Uh, like, did you get that feedback from from people? Oh no, not at all. I think I okay. think people are really liking this content. But it seems like almost more meditative, a little bit of a retreat from from the shared life world and paying attention to your own uh, right. perception, which could be a little bit solipsistic. Um, yeah. But here we're making the case that it's not solipsistic. Yeah. Right. 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 So where do we start? All right. I'd like to. I'd like to start with a term, Victor, maybe I can kick this to you so I don't have to uh, keep talking. Sure. A term that I also know Eric is fond of, uh, intersubjectivity. So how do we right. move from uh, subjectivism, which is uh, an accusation often leveled against Sartre's account of freedom, which is like, history doesn't matter to me. I'm an anarchist. Uh, nothing affects me. I make all my own choices. And how do we move from that to... Uh, intersubjectivity here with Merleau-Ponty. Now, I would say that probably Sartre is closer to Merleau-Ponty than a lot of people think. I've, I've read some convincing <laughs> stuff about that, um, and, and I think he probably has a similar account of intersubjectivity. He just likes to emphasize this kind of radical freedom point, but that's neither here nor there. Um, yeah, so intersubjectivity, I think, is really just this idea that like our subjectivity relies on, on, on for its own existence and coherence on its engagement with other subjectivities. So there is like uh, that like realities are created in some ways, worlds are created through intersubjective engagement, through engagement with other subjects. There would be no subject if not for that interaction between subjects. And I think you can see this with language. Um, I think language is like the location of a lot of intersubjectivity. In some ways, it wouldn't be possible if it was only subjectivity. Language is only possible intersubjectivity. There's other philosophers who pick up on this, you know, who aren't in the phenomenological tradition. I think to some extent this is really, you know, uh, Wittgenstein's point when he says that, like, mm -hmm. you can't have a private language. You have to, like that. It, 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 it depends on engagement with other subjects. And I think Merleau-Ponty also is thinking about how perception and worldliness, as we talked about in, in previous life worldliness, as we talked about in previous pot ep episodes uh, relies on that interaction um you know and and i think that also is a broader theme in merleau-ponty that like it's neither this nor that it's like neither objectivity or subjectivity it's neither that like perception is neither like some su like coherent subject looking down at the world but it's actually the world and the subject interaction interacting that somehow like perception subjectivity is not on either side but is like in the middle in the interaction is the thing and that that goes for subjects as well and i also wanted to stress how deeply this can go uh, particularly when it comes to the language point so wittgenstein made a really nice point where um he observed uh in one of the blue or brown books i can't quite recall uh that if i were to try to ask you are you experiencing a pain right now uh and you said yes 
Uh, you might think of that as a purely private experience, right? What could be more private really than experiencing pain? But in fact, there's an intersubjective component to it because you need the word pain to be given to you to be able to articulate the point both to yourself and to others that I am in pain. Uh, so in fact, the life world uh, and even our ability to think uh, in the language of thought, if you want to call it that, depends a great deal on the other. Yeah, of course, we're not doing our episode on Wittgenstein. Maybe we should, in the, and maybe we should in the future. Um, you should, yeah. And it's interesting because I think that his concept of like forms of life might have a lot of overlap with life world, but... Um, yeah, I think so. But I would say that, uh, yeah, maybe we can save that for If a lion time. could speak, we would not be able to understand what it says. Um, and you, I, you we should say stress, that a lot more intensely. <laughs> we, should also, yeah, we should also stress that language is like the most evident form of intersubjectivity. But it's not the only one. Even perception mm -hmm. itself, the fact that that there is a view that could be anywhere kind of implies what he calls the gaze. The gaze is not a, a hostile like it is in a psychoanalysis, or can be, I should say, in psychoanalysis. The gaze is more like any point of view can occupy any point of sight specifically, and that implies that you're not the only seeing, perceiving I shouldn't say seeing because that's only one sense, but perce perception could happen from anywhere. And because it does happen from other places besides you, it implies this intersubjective perceptual world. Yeah, I guess um, I would ask here is, so this existential interpretation of subjectivity or intersubjectivity or whatever, if we're not even going to use the subject object language, he seems to say that it's existing or coexisting interhuman relations. He uses terms like that. Now in the in the classical sort of Marxist framework, right, we don't we're not directly intersubjective. We are our subjective relations are mediated by products, the products of, of production that that we encounter uh, on the market and we, labor in, relations we should add in there right yeah so so we uh, we encounter the products of our labor which are kind of like objectified social relations on the market and we lose that sort of direct personal dependency that you know characterizes earlier eras so um, when you know when when Ponty here he gives this sort of classic, look at at dialectical materialism he kind of highlights that that economics production is the basis of the base and and that our history is determined by by um, that is human history is determined by the economic relations and the way those are elaborated by the relations of production that obtain on top of them which is includes sort of objectified social relations I think here it's actually worth Situating this a little bit in intellectual context, uh, because one of the big debates that were going on, uh, that was going on in French Marxist circles at this point, uh, was how seriously to take Lukács' uh, seminal reinterpretation of dialectical materialism along more Hegelian lines. Uh, and this has direct bearing uh, for somebody like Merleau-Ponty, since, of course, Lukács' main argument is precisely that the life world presents itself as a kind of reified entity uh, that people are un unable to interact with and unable to change. Uh, they just have to kind of accept it because it's been naturalized for them. Uh, and I don't think that Merleau Ponty is entirely critical of this idea, uh, but he definitely argues that it's a retreat back in some senses, focusing on this uh, from strict dialectical materialism in the classical Marxist sense, since it focuses a lot on the ideas in our head and how the life world presents itself to perception rather than the material practices that we engage in. Um, with our body and in interaction with others. Um, so it's a really important debate historically. Right, and when we say uh, these material practices, he, he's, he thinks that this Marxist way of interpreting everything only via economics is overdetermining a little bit our interpretation of human history. Because yeah. for sure, our interaction with the world is economic in some senses. But he's also saying it's not just economic. So sort of like what he did when he's saying Descartes got this like half right and then went a little bit too far. He's kind of saying the same thing with Marxist history, which is you're not actually paying attention to how economics affects somebody. 
you make up this thing called class consciousness. Class consciousness is supposed to be like swirling around us, but we don't ever actually look at the objects themselves. Where do we get class consciousness from? And he goes into this a little bit saying, our interpretation of economics is not from, you know, sitting and reflecting on it. Our interpretation of economics happens when we go to the grocery store and we see how much things cost. Uh, relative to how much we make, or when we are getting paid a certain amount compared to um, our friend who we go out for lunch with, and he's getting paid a certain amount. So in each of these direct interactions is when we feel um, economics, not as, a, not as an abstract thing, but as a concrete thing. And our, our sensibility towards revolution, which he, he keeps bringing up, the sensibility towards revolution comes from a buildup of those, you know, uh, molecular interactions, not from having some grand scope of history. Yeah. And I think it's also important to stress here that while on the one hand, he's criticizing this Lucasian uh, Hegelian Marxism, uh, which is quite sophisticated, I should say. So I don't think we should just dismiss it. Uh, he's also criticizing another kind of vulgar Marxism mm. uh, that emphasizes the materiality of human beings. Yes. Uh, but foregrounds labor. Uh, as kind of the exclusively dominant human power, uh, or even tries to define all human activity in terms of laboring and creating our world. Uh, and Ponty says, absolutely, there's no doubt that laboring is a huge part of what we do with our body. Uh, whether you're talking about, you know, these kind of Lockeans in the state of nature who are tilling their farms, or you talk about somebody in 20th century France working at a factory. But it's not the only kind of activity we engage in in a capitalist society that's materially meaningful. There's also, like uh, Pills was pointing out, going to the store, buying a baguette, buying some cigarettes, uh, sitting there talking about how there's no meaning to life and <laughs> scribbling that down in mm -hmm. nausea. Uh, you know, all this is extremely important as well. And it's kind of missed uh, by this vulgar Marxism, which really runs the risk of almost renaturalizing uh, the bourge bourgeois man uh, and making the same mistake that a lot of classical liberal theorists day made, uh, which is also to emphasize this notion that who human beings are are laborers first and foremost. That's a vulgar Marxist take, by the way. I don't think Marx actually believed that at all, uh, although you can sometimes get that sense from his early writings uh, if you don't look at them closely. Yeah, I'm not super familiar with the Hegelian interpretation of Marxism. But yeah, that you say that became widespread or at least influential when Lukács put it forward and it was picked up by the Frankfurt School where they, they emphasize the sort of subjective component as it exists sort of against nature, you'd say. Like nature is excluded from the historical materialist dialectic. I mean, this is some of the new directions that like eco-Marxism is thinking in anyway, is that you exclude nature from the dialectic. So nature, again, just becomes this sort of background against which humans conduct their activities. And it's it's... I mean, from a more modern perspective, it's kind of maybe problematic to to limit it that way, but it's a kind of, it's one kind of reduction anyway. And then the other kind of reduction is, yeah, the sort of vulgar materialist reduction of, of that, that somehow economic relations are causal of, uh, of, of subjective aspects of our, you know, of our life world, I guess you'd call it, that they're not exclusively causal relations that Ponty mentions here. Um, they are, they are, it's, it's more, I don't know. I want to say, dis I want to say descriptive um, without, without necessarily limiting it to like Husserl's version of phenomenology. Um, it's, it's, it's also interpretive, I guess, after Heidegger as well, right? His sort of hermeneutic variety that he introduces and now what happened here, I guess, in the context of, of between Heidegger and, and Ponty is that existentialism became a major movement with Jean-Paul Sartre. And so he, he wrote these series of articles sort of misinterpreting Heidegger a little bit, Heidegger's focus on Dasein. Um, and he misinterpreted this and said that existentialism is a humanism. And this is something Heidegger really didn't like. It was kind of a misunderstanding between the two. Um, but for, for better or worse, it, it it picked up steam. 
And so you have this sort of existential interpretation of phenomenology. But Ponte's Ponte's here is I, I'm I'm not I, I'm not actually not entirely sure how it relates to Sartre's version of existentialism. Um, well, he kind of calls it the same way that he goes between intellectualism and empiricism, hmm. like we talked about last week. He also comes here between uh, materialism and what he calls spiritualism. So he's hmm. not simply a materialist. Um, because he says, like, the economic part of our life is but one part of our life. That's not the part that just provides, generates, and establishes all meaning. It's important, but it's not the only one. And then spiritualism, I can't, I, I'm not exactly sure who he's talking about when he's saying spiritualism. It sounds like um, Hegel and, and Sartre could both be accused of that by saying hmm. this is about yeah, like history is about thought in some way, not about these interactions. But he's going to go right down the middle and say, you know what? It's both. You're both part right. If you just look at someone's life, the way they interact, the way they think about um, their economic situation, but also try to find meaning, you're just going to realize that it's both. Right. So is it yeah. is it is it kind uh, of the objection also like that? Especially against, I guess, the first kind, sorry, like the non-spiritualism. What, what was the other one? Is it just materialism or what does he yeah, say? Yeah, it's spiritualism. I'll just read the quote here. History mm -hmm. has no single signification. What we do always has several senses. And this is how, how an existential conception of history is distinguished from both materialism and spiritualism. Right. Yeah, okay. I so I think... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So I think like what's interesting about that is uh, like I, I also think this relates to kind of... um like Merleau-Ponty's interest in resisting, like rep like thinking about things through representation. Cause I, cause I feel like one of the things he's doing, especially on the like more materialist side is like, I think he's accusing it of, the, of kind of just reducing the world, uh, the life world into just this kind of like representation that like reduces everything to these kind of like logical um, economic relations. And like, he doesn't want us to forget uh, about like the lived experience. But at the same time, I think he's also worried that like thinking about things through the perspective of just like this lived experience perspective also can mystify because it like becomes this, I guess I'm what I'm taking him to mean by spiritualism could be wrong, but that's kind of how I'm hearing it. It's kind of like avoiding just like reductive representationalism, but then avoiding like this over kind of reification of like, just like, uh, Oh, lived experience is like this, this thing that you can't necessarily contain. It's like, I think he wants to say you can talk about it. You can identify it. But you can't just like put it all under the heading of like one or the other way of thinking, I guess. I mean, the way that I read his spiritualism is, again, going back to the kind of Lukács point, and I think it's important to stress that at the time, it might seem a little bit difficult to recognize in hindsight, Lukács was like the hottest shit in Marx's theory. Uh, Lucien Goldman wrote a book on Kant where he described Lukács, Heidegger, and Kant, along with Marx, as like the most seminal thinkers uh, of the modern era, which seems a little bit weird in hindsight because one of those doesn't really belong. Uh, but, you know, Lukacs has this defense of not just Bolshevism, which Ponty is going to take very, very critically, uh, but also a kind of teleological vision of history, which is that the reified life world uh, will eventually be overcome when we develop a sufficiently refined class consciousness. There'll be a revolution. It's pretty much inevitable. And we'll get something that to Lukacs's mind will look a little bit like the Bolshevik state, uh, or at least the Bolshevik state as it could have, as it should have been. Uh and Ponty is a lot more critical of this, saying that this takes dialectics, Hegelian dialectics with all the kind of spiritualist undertones, way, way, way too seriously uh, and undermines a lot of the more materialist dimensions of Marx. Because, uh, of course, this idealist uh, teleological vision of history says that all we need to do is wait for class consciousness to emerge, break open the reified life world, and then we'll get the Bolshevik paradise that's awaiting us. And Ponty is going to say, absolutely not, right? You can't just sit there and expect class consciousness to assume this kind of form over a long enough period of time. That's a kind of spiritual or almost religious orientation. Uh, mm. You need to actually go out there and to put it really bluntly, convince the working classes uh, that they're being exploited, that things are shit, and that there are ways of changing it. Uh, and, you know, that's a, a practical political project. And he spends a fair bit of time actually writing about it. But I find that quite refreshing because, like a lot of people, I do find these kind of cheesy teleological visions of history you find some vulgar Marxists put forward really irritating. Uh, 
and have a they have this kind of religious quality to them. You might be onto something in that uh, both he and Sartre attended Kojev's lectures, mm. yeah. and Kojev has a, a kind of end of history thesis. But um, more to the point, this class consciousness, it's like if you go out and just like convince people as if that's the way that like human existence works, you need to be convinced of things before you act. That's wrong here. Oh yeah, that's, that's this, this, like, especially in the especially in the second passage that you had us read, right? Like that that's like the main thesis of those pages, I think, yeah. right? So people are going to react to things that affect them. They're not going to react you, to ideas. And this is yeah. I think what what we can we can tell our our Marxist Twitter friends. You don't just convince people and then they suddenly act in a certain way. They're not going to Yeah, I love that. They're not going to revolt. Yeah. Because you told them ideas. That's not how. That's not how this whole thing is going to work. One of Pills' really, oh, favorite. Wait, wait. You're saying that if we don't just hand out copies of the Communist Manifesto in a factory, uh, we're going to get a revolution tomorrow? That's bullshit. If I handed out enough copies of the Communist Manifesto, give me five days and we'll see the Canadian state overthrown. Man, I, I wish. Feel like you I should wish call they this would episode actually a... hand out papers because they don't even I, do that. Pills. They just tweet at them, calling them. You know. Pills, I feel, I feel like you should call this episode uh, like Marxism and why ideas don't matter because that's like one of your favorite things. Your, one of your favorite things to say, Pills, all the time. Even like, yeah, you'll say ideas don't matter. Ideas don't matter. Why do you care about ideas? They don't matter. And I feel like here we go. Merleau-Ponty saying Merle, I ideas don't I, matter. I wasn't the first to say it. Um, and he's not saying they don't matter, to be fair. I know. But I know, I know, he's I know, saying, know. let's go through the middle here because people are going to revolt or uh, the revolutionary consciousness, if we want to call it that, does not come from convincing. It comes from when you go to the, the grocery store and you can't afford what's on the shelf. That's where, that's where dissatisfaction and then what we call class consciousness comes from. But he doesn't even like the term class consciousness because it assumes no. this, this whatever, miasma. Cogito. That as almost, soon as people too, like subjectively... Uh, give mental assent towards an idea, then they're going to revolt. And that's not how it works. Well, it's not. It's, you know, this thesis is not that dissimilar from like kind of what Heidegger says, where it's like you don't even notice the object until it breaks. It's like, you know, you're not going to actually notice like the revolution until like your world breaks and like something comes up and you're like, oh, why is this shit so expensive? Like, fuck this. You yeah, know? You, you don't yeah. you don't recognize your economic conditions until you can't afford something, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, Jizek had a wonderful quote uh, about the Arab Spring back in 2011, quite some time ago, where he points out that what set that off wasn't people distributing revolutionary pamphlets. It was just some guy in Tunis uh, who was tired of having to pay bribes to the government to sell his fruit in front of the government buildings. So what did he do? He went, he set himself on fire. Pretty dramatic choice. Uh, but then a lot of people just got fucking pissed off and they're like, you know what? He's right. Uh, and then they smashed the government and replaced it with a more Republican one. Uh, and I think that's a real testament to this kind of Pontian wisdom, right? A lot of people don't react because they're handed a pamphlet or because they're handed a set of ideas. They get pissed off at the material impact on their lives of this policy or this practice or whatever it happens to be. And that's the spark uh, that lights the fire, like right, Billy Joel yeah. would say. I did actually think about that uh, that Arab Spring when I was reading reading this. And, you know, it's it's yeah. kind of consistent with some of the stuff. It's interesting. I. I kind of forgot about this passage and in, in my own work, you know, uh, this is like fairly consistent with how I'm using Mary Laponte to talk about some some other like um, kind of like radical democratic theory and like like kind of vaguely anarchistic theories that I think end up leaning on ideas, not in the same way. Anyway, that's like a bit of a bit of a tangent that I don't necessarily want to go down. But like um, what I like about this, uh, I think that's and, a perfect this on... tangent, actually, if you want to. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, think it's why, why revolution is not just a decision that we make on Twitter, you know? Yeah, and actually, like, so specifically, there's a part here on page uh, 470 where, you know, he says, um, you know, it's unlikely uh, that the Russian peasants of 1917 explicitly set them set for themselves the task of revolution and the transformation of property relations. Like, and I think this is important, like, specifically the idea of, like, explicitly setting yourself for the task. Like, it's some, like, deliberate, deliberate uh, activity that you like, you kind of like have this idea, oh, revolution, I want that end goal. Uh, and I actually really like how in the sentence right after that, he says, there is no need for each proletarian to conceive himself as a proletarian in the sense a Marxist theoretician gives this word, right? So he's saying like, you know, that doesn't matter. You don't need to think about, uh, you don't need to understand any of this stuff. It's going to kind of happen. And I think um, a lot of 
um, radical theories um, of kind of like democratic participation that I find somewhat objectionable. They, I think that they implicitly require this kind of like deliberate activity of like, I'm going to be a radical subject. I'm going to constantly be living in this permanent revolution and setting myself the task of being like this egalitarian subject that is going to be like, you know, engaged in political mobilization all the time. And it's like, I think from a Mira Lepontian perspective, like that's just that that's a dead end that doesn't go anywhere. I should also say that it's it's also not really consistent with the real history uh, of radicalism, even on the sort of radicalism these people like. I mean, the Bolshevik Revolution didn't take place because people distributed copies of Lenin's What Must Be Done to the population. Uh, it occurred in no small part because of the First World War, a huge number of different uh, factors associated with that, uh, but also because the Bolshevik slogan was very simple. It was land, bread, and peace, yeah. right? That's what motivated people, not we need to instantiate the revolutionary socialist state in line with the teleology of Marx's dialectical history. Right. Nobody would fucking march. For well, that. I think the most important part was the actual organizational activities that Trotsky and Lenin were engaging in. They were organizing Soviets, which are those small councils. It's that kind of actual activity that brought it about. Right. That was the conditions that were established first. Not not simply sloganing, not not sloganeering, not that sort of hundredth monkey effect of how ideas or behaviors spread in the kind of mysterious way. It was actual organizational activities. That's what you got. That yeah, was and those and those organiz it. and those organizational activities were obviously reacting to something like very perceptible in like the life world. I think like you're right that like the kind of material organization was crucial. But I also think like to me, I also feel that Mira Laponte gives some good theoretical material to understand why that activity fizzled and it transformed into something else afterwards because it's like because because that that activity has to be responding to something that's present and then all of a sudden it was overthrown and then like then they no longer there's no longer like a present at hand like reason or actually ready to hand reason for why uh you need to be engaging in this organizing activity now it's like well we won we overthrew them and then I think all of that stuff just gets sedimented and it kind of congeals and becomes like no longer active in the same way that like the account that I think Meryl Ponty here is giving about how this revolutionary action kind of like depends on like the ready to hand situation that's right in front of you that you're reacting to kind of in a, in a, in a vitalistic way. It's like happening right there and you're reacting and you're organizing in response to that. But once that goes away, I think that um, there's just all kinds of opportunity for kind of like habit uh, the habit body and, and 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 other relations to kind of just like decay into something else. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to reconnect this to our our previous episode on this and just like most of what most people do most of the time is not represented in their head with a goal that's explicit. Most of it is this body body intentionality moving here, moving there. You're not thinking about it explicitly. And his account of the of the Russian Revolution is similar to that. Like, sure, people were organized into Soviets, but why did they leave their house in the first place? They left their house because something else was wrong that they wanted to fix, and, and not explicitly say, "I want to, I want to have a revolution in in Russia." Now, Lenin thought that, but Lenin didn't do the revolution by himself, right? It was it was the yeah. material bodily lived experiences of people that were being exploited and and finally for whatever reason it clicked that they were being exploited and that's what got them out of their houses yeah well that's what i was getting at with the peace land and bread slogan yeah 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 uh, i wasn't trying to apply something uh, cheesy like if the soviets had chosen or bolsheviks had chosen some shittier slogan history would have been very different if they had gone with overthrow the bourgeois state uh people would have decided to stay home uh, what was captured by the slogan, you know, peace, land and bread is that people were materially suffering a great deal because of the consequences of the First World War. Uh, the kinds of exploitation that were present in their society were extremely vivid uh, because the authoritarian high mindedness uh, with which the war was carried out. Uh, and as Pill said, I think that people just finally clicked. Uh, and this slogan was powerful in part because it connected with what they really wanted uh, at that point, uh, which is food for everybody. Uh, land so that there's a relative level of equality in society and peace because they don't want to have to keep throwing their sons and daughters into a meat grinder against the German war machine. Uh, yeah, you know they, they also oh. wanted out of that 
they also wanted out of the um, the the wealthy landowner relationship, right? They were it was a system of debt slavery that that had set in near the end of the 19th century for various reasons. This debt slavery situation. It wasn't just World War One. That might have been the catalyst, but it, that was not the sort of cause, right? It's like the revolution. Revolutionary activity is a long and slow and painstaking process. It's not something that just kind of clicks into place when the right sets of things come together. It's something that you have to work towards and you have to plan for. And then obviously with the the experiences of the Bolshevik revolution, right, it can go very wrong. Same thing with the French revolution, oh, yeah. right? Ends up in the great terror. So something, you know, one step forward, two steps back kind of thing. But it, but it's that long, slow process in the background as well, that long overarching process. So the question that he'd be interested with respect to why did people leave their house is they saw in the world, this is like the Merleau-Pontian term world, it solicited them with possibility. So at, exactly. at whatever time they saw this 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 uh, class relate, well, they wouldn't call it because that's representational, but you know, the class relationship that I'm involved in, I don't have to keep living like this. And however that possibility occurs is like the the brink of of change at that point. Yeah, I also think that like the it's it's not only are they perceiving possibilities, but uh, but in a way it's like um the, the other word I'm, I'm it's it's on the tip of my tongue, but it's like you know the the opposite of like an invitation, but it's almost like if things get so bad, I think that you also see like um you know requirements on action, right? Like you perceive you're pulled and you're like, well, I like what else am I going to do? It's like you have to act, like you know. Yeah, um, you, and you I, have nothing else to lose yeah. at that point. Yeah, and yeah, I also, I say, also, Marx, oh, that, Marx oh. captured that beautifully, where he said, you know, the workers have nothing to lose but their chains, right? Yeah, yeah, I think exactly. That evocatively captures exactly the sentiment that you're trying to get. But I at. also yeah. wanted to kind of, kind of uh, say something that I kind of just noticed as I, as we were talking like a little bit before, <laughs> that I think what's funny is that you could maybe make a Merleau-Pontian argument for accelerationism, because <laughs> like because you need to make the conditions so bad. That people's like li that people's like life world changes that they're like that they're pushed in action uh, because like you're not going to convince them with ideas you're not going to convince like you're not going to get changed so it's like you have to make things so bad now I don't it's I don't I don't want that like that's not a, a view that I would support I just think it's kind of amusing that I think that th there's a possibility that I'm detecting here for an accelerationist Mayor Lapontian account of revolution just see if I understand you right the way to solve our ec our environmental crisis contra Eric is to pollute the environment so recklessly. Well, it depends like, what kind of... No, it depends on the kind of... The everything. breaking point. <laughs> it depends on the kind of accelerationism we're talking about. What Ike Moore had in mind was like, you know, like wishing for worse policies that like that, that exact... Like you want to make the income inequality worse and worse and worse so that like at some point we could get to a point where, you know... Um, I mean, I obviously don't support that. But it's say, kind of funny okay, that I'm you can. Stop I'm going to stop recycling right now. I'm going to fucking use oil for everything I can. Gonna go make yeah. a gasoline fire right tonight. It's like let's kick capitalism into hyperdrive. Or if we can't go around it, we're gonna go through the motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, you heard it. This is a call for all leftists everywhere to advocate for the total deregulation of Uber, Amazon. <laughs> because seriously, the people are not company. gonna act. Uh, you know, uh, just just like if, if things aren't <laughs> if things aren't bad enough. Uh, no, uh, no, I, I get what you're saying. I, I wasn't intending to be mirthful about that. It was just. Something like something we were talking about last night. Yeah. One, yeah, one thing enough. that he does say in the in the second section that I gave to you is that like he has you have to see something worse almost quickly to be able to break a habit. It has to it has to uh, the conditions have to worse worsen very quickly because otherwise you just kind of get used to them. But as soon yeah, as exactly. you see like my life is worse than my parents' life, like the faster that that happens, the more you're gonna think like. I can act to change this. Otherwise, if it's just like everyone slowly becomes an Amazon employee over like the out of next... curiosity, out of curiosity, does that mean he's being a little bit unfair to Sartre? Uh, I mean, I'm all for kicking transcendental narcissism, as Foucault put it, down a couple pegs. Uh, but Sartre did have this wonderfully evocative comment where I once said he never felt freer uh, than when he was in a Nazi prisoner camp, POW camp, really, uh, because under those kind of circumstances, he realized that. Every kind of gesture and act he made had extraordinary significance uh, as an expression of his freedom. Uh, and if he hadn't been put in that kind of condition and was just going through his everyday life, 
in a kind of normalized life world, uh, the importance of the individual act wouldn't have been as transparent to him. So, I mean, he puts it more poetically in uh, Nausea, but that's the kind of general idea. And it seems to have this Pontian quality to it, if that's what you're aiming for. Merleau-Ponty is quite critical of Sartre's Marxism because, well, I, I think Sartre actually said, I'm, I'm not a Marxist, I'm, a, I'm an anarchist. But Merleau-Ponty's sense of Sartre, his criticism of Sartre, um, in Adventures of the Dialectic, is that he, he, he thinks all contingency is bad. The only thing that he wants to overthrow is contingency to have this radical sense of freedom. And I'm I'm guessing if don't you mean overthrow necessity or no like no contingency like that the previous actions are are why things are the way they are now. Oh okay okay I got you all right go ahead. And he's like that's that's just not how any human how the human life works. I think that might be what he's calling spiritualism because so much of what we do I keep using this term ninety five percent ninety five percent is related to habit. It's not explicit. Yeah. I'm free. Here's my action. Uh, like Sartre is still going to take shits, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think also the reason why sometimes we don't realize how much of it is kind of like habit and like response and kind of like response to the situation that is kind of unconscious is because often when we think about our past actions, we apply kind of like post hoc like rationalizations for like why we did the thing, right? Like we often think about it. It's like, oh, I did that because I decided to do this. But it's like if you think about it deeply enough, you realize that like in the moments you're kind of just reacting. Uh, OK, I, I do get that. I mean, it sounds almost like a Borges uh, plot in some senses, because I, I do understand that like, if you really had to deliberate upon taking any kind of action uh, and ask yourself, is this truly what I want to do as an expression of my freedom? Life probably would become unbearable. So in some senses, Ponty's argument for habit uh, and the persistence of habit is really a relief uh, because the fact that we do so many things habitually and not deliberately um, frees up a lot of our cognitive time to focus on other things. Would that be the way that you put it? Yeah. And paradoxically, I think you're onto something there because it does also create okay. conditions of a, of, a, of a kind of freedom because we are like, because we are released from like the deliberate, the deliberative requirement of every action. We are actually free to kind of like be, and that's actually why a lot of Merleau-Pontians like do like talk about like music and Merleau-Ponty talks about musical instruments and kind of like the way your body gets absorbed into the act of like music creation and jazz. The, the improvisation is like almost unconscious. You're in, but it allows yeah. for a tremendous amount of freedom, right? Like, like if you had sure. to like deliberately consciously think, oh, I'm going to play this note. I'm going to like the, the creative potential would be gone. Like, like you just couldn't, sure. you couldn't do anything. Like, like your body has to be like absorbed into the action in a way that where you're like, where your body kind of takes over for you. And there's like this kind of like, I don't know, you can use all kinds of evocative language to describe that process, but it's kind of a freedom in the not having to think rationally about it. No, no, I, I get that. I mean, I really like the Sartre analogy about feeling free in a POW camp, um, yeah. because even if it's problematic, it does have this kind of evocative quality to it. But I absolutely agree that it almost sounds like a Borges story, like Fumes the Memorias. Uh, if I were having to sit there being like, do I want to move my foot forward? Will I move my foot forward? Going to take the next step. Should I do that? Right. Uh, that would be an unbearable kind of life. Uh, and it would mean all my mental activity is focused on things that are really pretty pedantic uh, that I would almost want to be automated uh, and free of my consciousness. Or imagine control. or ima I remember talking right. about this in a Nietzsche seminar <clears throat> um, when we were talking about like thought. And I think it speaks to, to Mary Laponte. Like imagine sure. how horrifying it would be if you had to decide to have a thought. Right. So like you're <laughs> yeah. like, I'm going to have that. I'm going to decide to allow that thought to come into my head. And it's like you had to go through this process of like of like deciding to have thoughts every time you have a thought like that's a fucking nightmare. Jesus. Well, I mean, to be fair, I do know what that experience is like because I once ate a whole plate uh, full of brownies uh, and started tripping out. And I yeah. was like, don't think about that. Don't think, oh, my God, I am thinking about that. No, 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 no. Don't think about that. And it was just a horrible cycle. Uh, and everything went downhill from there. So believe me, the Pontian nightmare uh, is real. So it's it's interesting if we're uh Sartre's, Sartre's mode of freedom is I can think of whatever I want, therefore I am free. And that's Merleau Ponty has a half a third of this book is on freedom. But it's not that kind of freedom. It's not I just think I can think whatever I want. It's like your body affords you free possibilities. And I think uh the musical instrument example is a, a perfect one, because that makes you free to play that instrument. 
And that's not like right. affordances as you were saying. Yeah. Right? And yeah. while if you're good at an instrument, you're probably thinking about something else while, while you're playing, you know, and it's but that the freedom comes from um, being so familiar with these different aspects of the world that that you can use them, use uh, be creative. You have these capacities to be with this mit sign in the world that is uh not not intellectual it's not intellectualized in the way that that starts like i can i can think about whatever i want if i go to a cafe i'm free to wonder if pierre is there or not etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah there's that that interesting example that sart gives of of freedom free like ex radical existential freedom a famous example of the person whose whose brother was killed in the war and they want to join the army and go and avenge him but the person also lives with their mother, and if they're to leave their mother alone, something really awful might happen to her. Right? She might be she might become depressed or kill herself or get killed or something like that. So you're faced with this impossible decision, and you it's two sort of options that you cannot weigh against each other. There's no rational calculus you can apply to it to make the decision for you. You have to make the decision yourself. And so you're radically free in the sense that either option, it's down to you. You decide which one to do. But if you want to try and figure out which question is the right or which answer is the right one, there's no way to do that. Because again, that would imply the responsibility isn't yours. The responsibility is you applying some kind of rational or decision making framework, whatever it is, cost benefit analysis, all that bullshit. You have to make the choice and you're radically free to do it, but each choice could fuck you over in some way. And that's the sort of contingent aspect of being free in the existential sense, faced with impossible opposition, opposites like that. Yeah, I, saw, I read this wonderful uh, book that talked about this in the context of the Nazi occupation of Greece, uh, where apparently there was a scenario where there were revolutionary fighters hiding in a town. Uh, and so the SS uh, captured one of these revolutionary fighters, then lined everyone else up in the town uh, and told the guy, if you don't reveal to us which one uh, of these is your comrade, we're just going to shoot everybody, uh, every single person in the town. Uh, and the revolutionary said, fat freedom is more important. And then the SS killed everybody. Uh, and one of the questions that kind of emerged from this is, was this the right thing to do uh, to defy the SS officer at the price of the life of all these people? Uh, and the point that the person was trying to make from a kind of Sartrean perspective is there's no way of actually making that kind of judgment call uh, through a formal calculus. You just have to kind of decide what kind of thing you're going to prioritize in this instance and what kind of person you're willing to be, uh, understanding that you're fucked either way uh, and you're going to have to bear the responsibility of that. So I find these kinds of Sartrean conceptions of freedom at least evocative and poetic. Uh, I agree that Pontius is a lot more philosophically rich uh, but i think from a novelistic perspective he's always very talented so how do we chart in, in a sense that decision that i sort of outlined in relation to sart comes up here in the ponty reading as well uh you know that choice between between economics and materialism or spiritualism and that's almost like if if we're if we want to i don't know if we he says we have to choose between these two positions but not really because he has he has then he's going to reveal this different way of understanding them that makes the sort of decision disappear in a certain way but in a sense he presents spiritualism and materialism as choices we have to make you know do you want to work in the realm of ideas or do you want to work in the realm of 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 I don't know keying keying your actions to guiding history according to according to economic conditions and 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 what sorts of revolutionary struggles are going to become relevant in that context. Yeah, it's it's very much a parallel of his critiques of you know Cartesianism on one hand and empiricism on the other is you can't just go all the way in one direction like Sartre's Sartre's talking about revolution like it's this spontaneous free action that people are going to undertake and then that's kind of what he advocated for whereas um i don't know a, a scientific economic marxism is just going to say this is only material but and it's just it seems so obvious i guess in hindsight to be like of course it's not one of the yeah, other yeah i agree i mean 
And the weird thing is, despite his criticisms, this kind of fetishism uh, of the almost religious or apocalyptic quality of revolution is still very prevalent uh, in some major thinkers. Uh, I mean, all you need to do is read Alain Begio on revolution, uh, where he calls it a disruption in the order of being that cannot be predicted. Uh, but when it emerges, you either choose to show fidelity to it or you don't. Uh, to realize that there's a really religious quality to this. Uh, now, whatever it is that you think about that, I think that Merleau-Ponty is a lot more realistic and grounded, uh, where he says, no, religions, uh, religions, revolutions don't just emerge spontaneously as these kinds of events in the order of being. Uh, it takes a huge amount of work, much of which is going to be incredibly mundane. And you can't even count on just inspiring people by ideas to change things, because you actually need to be able to show them or they need to be able to see all the fucked up things in the world around them uh, before they're going to be motivated to action. Well, also, maybe maybe to just add a little nuance to that, I think that like it's not so much that um, I think that like the spontaneity of revolutions to Mer in like I think it exists in Merleau-Ponty because it's like going to occur from like the lived experience, but it's only really going to seem spontaneous to those who aren't affected by the revolution. Like yeah, everyone who yeah. right like they like they're experiencing the world and how shady it is and they see the clear reasons for why they would be angry, but it just seems spontaneous to an outsider who's like, you know, uh, I guess like a capitalist who's not involved, you know, for example. Yeah, I have a perfect I have a perfect quote of that. It was when like when he's talking about this uh, vision of spontaneous revolution, he says that people are talking about the other, you know, the pure negation. He might as well have been writ writing too bad you even though this was written 40 40 years before being an event, but he says uh Marlu Ponti says Marx was able to have and to transmit the illusion of a negation realized in history and in its matter only by making the non-capitalistic future an absolute other. But we who have witnessed a Marxist revolution well know that revolutionary society has its weight, its positivity, and is therefore not the absolute other. So this weight and positivity that he's talking about is that huge stack of lived experiences that caused the revolution in the first place. If you're looking at history as this dialectic from the outside, then it seems like, it, you, I mean, you could, you could conceive that this is just a spontaneous other event, not related to what happened before, totally non-contingent, but then you're forgetting the life world again. Yeah, yeah I, it, it, there's a fun comparison that Ponzi makes there too, right? Because, you know, think about when you're when you're healthy and you're going through your life, right? And you see somebody who's sick, right? And they're they're like, oh, sorry guys, I can't come out tonight. I'm I'm not feeling great. I'm gonna stay in bed. And everyone who's healthy is like, well, fuck this guy. What an idiot. Like, why why are you why are you missing out? But <laughs> Ponzi compares illness to revolution <laughs> says that says that history only presses closer to economics when the revolution approaches just as just as uh you are pressed closer to the vital rhythms of your body when you get sick so somebody who's not sick in, in that sense wouldn't understand the sort of vitality that revolution taps into right that it's like an illness that's happening and and then again you only see the the economic rhythms of history they only show through as the sickness gets worse as the revolution approaches and then until then history and economics seem like perfectly separate things right and he seems to think that so then in those times of of you know relative quiet right they separate and history becomes the realm of ideas right the history of ideas and 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 then i think maybe that's bourgeois that's that's bourgeois spiritualism and then on the other hand everything is economics right so then that becomes the sort of the sort of vulgar Marxism mm. and you have that materialist yeah. side. So you have this split between, again, spiritualism and materialism. Spiritualism is the kind of conservative, backwards looking bourgeois side, whereas materialism is the forward looking. And we, and we can't see how they're related until shit hits the fan, basically, until the illness hits until the revolution comes and then we see how interdependent they are and how silly the opposition is in the first place i got this guy just he just fucking nails it does he not it's like this is just killer who merlo ponte yeah. yeah he does he does yeah. nail it and actually i i i i, I wanted to like there's such a great quote uh just like 
on page 473 where he's talking about like being an individual and so he says you know at the outset i'm not an individual above class i'm situated socially and my freedom even if it has the power to commit me elsewhere does not have the power to turn me immediately into what i decide to be thus being bourgeois or or a worker is not merely being conscious of so being it is it is to give myself the value of a worker or a bourgeois uh, through an implicit existential project that merges with our way of articulating the world and of coexisting with others. Um, and then he says, my decision takes up a spontaneous sense of life that it can confirm or deny, but that it cannot annul. Um, so anyway, that's, I think that's like a nice, like sum up, I feel like of kind of like the view he's trying to, to, to push forward here. Yeah, and I mean, it well, doesn't real quick, real quick. Cause of Victor, Victor's got to go. So oh yeah. Right. Bye to right. Victor. But can Victor, bye, the quotation Victor. that you read, what's he, I, I, I was trying to follow along and I don't have the book open, but is he saying that we are members of classes, but you don't have to be conscious of being a member of a class to be in a class or what is, what is the point of that? Well, I think the point that I, I took away from it was like, you know, he does it like you don't have the power uh, through like thought to just like decide to be that thing. But rather, it's like an interplay between um, like merging like the, the world that you're experiencing with other people and this existential project. Um, and like you, you can't just like decide, even though you have the power to commit yourself. So like you can commit yourself to the to the conditions that are in front of you. But like you can't just like decide to be like, oh, I am a member of this bourgeois. It's like it's like it has to it has to cohere, I guess, um, with this what he calls existential project. Um, but yeah, it is a little bit it is a little bit, um, you know, ambiguous, maybe. Well, I, I mean, well, that's that just sense. intersubjectivity is like replacing yeah. replacing class a little bit with not just like labor relations, but it's also an inter intersubjective uh there's yeah, and actually, like right, right after that quote, you know, he says idealism and objective thought. And by the way, I don't know if we mentioned this in previous episodes, but objective thought is really just the name that Mary Laponte gives to those two views we were talking about in the last two podcasts: intellectualism and empiricism. Those two together is what he calls objective thought. Um, so he says idealism and objective thought equally miss the arrival of class consciousness. The first because it deduces actual existence from consciousness. The other because it derives consciousness from actual existence and both of them because they are unaware of the relation of motivation. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so class consciousness is unconscious. <laughs> yeah. Par well, Parsh it's both. Partially. I think he's trying to say that. It, I think he's, again, as Mayor Laponte is always going to do, he's kind of trying to locate that space in the middle, uh, you know, to say like, you know, it's not really one or the other. Both are, you are missing something, but anyway, that was a great discussion. So I don't know. I can just say, uh, Thanks, guys. Good discussion. And then, if you want, you could yeah. edit that <laughs> to like the end if you want. Victor's, Victor's got to go <laughs> teach. No, we don't have to. We yeah, don't have to hide teach. the fact that you have to go teach. You know. Yeah, I have to go teach Aristotle's politics in two minutes. Literally, I have my Zoom open, <laughs> uh, so I will. I will go and start that meeting. All right, see you, dude. All right, All later. right whip them. Right. Whip them good. Yeah, I will. I'd also like to point out that I think that his view is a lot closer to a genuine kind of Marxist perspective, uh, like a robust philosophical Marxism. Uh, because there's kind of vulgar Marxist millenarianism uh, that you'll sometimes see in people like Bedju, I should point out. Uh, whereas this, there's this idea that a revolution is necessarily going to be, again, this event in the order of being, you can't understand it, uh, and it's going to transform everything. And Marx never actually believed that. Uh, in fact, in the Critique of the Gotha program, he was very explicit about the fact that we need to understand revolution dialectically. Uh, we also need to recognize that any new society that emerges is going to be, as you put it, stamped with features of the old one. Uh, because you can't just have this attitude of we're going to throw everything aside and then rebuild from scratch. That's not the way that history works. Uh, history is defined by material relations and matter always just changes uh, form rather than being destroyed or fundamentally transformed. Uh, so I think that Ponty is really on the nose here uh, and trying to revive the more sincere concept of Marxist revolution from its kind of fetishization uh, in a lot of French radical theory. I just want to say that I genuinely think that this materialist account of phenomenology is much more to my taste than some of the other more idealist tinged flavors um, that I've been exposed to in the past and that I've been quite critical of, including in my new book. And I happen to think that Merlin Yeah, th Matt, I wanted to ask you that yeah. you you kind of sounded like you're accusing phenomenology of being a little bit solipsistic. Did this change your mind at all about it, that? It changed my mind about this version of phenomenology. So if you right. wanted to say, am I on team or Merleau-Ponty? The answer would be yes. Am I on team phenomenology? Uh, it would be, I'm on team Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology, not on okay. team 
Heidegger's uh, phenomenology or Team Horstel's phenomenology. So, yes, with caveats. This, the sense that I'm getting from going through this, by the way, this book is 1945. Mm -hmm. This is so underrated yeah, as a book. Yeah, definitely. I agree. I mean, it's it's a great book, and it's so like rich. this does not this does not get the citations that it deserves for sure. <laughs> First, he starts off by just saying all of philosophy up till now is wrong, and here's why, and then ends with like Marxist Marxist future phenomenology and an account of freedom. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the nice thing about this book also uh, that you don't usually find in masterpieces in philosophy is that. You can never say that he's not really fair to every side of the argument. Uh, in fact, one of the things that I found annoying about reading the book the first time I went through it is you sometimes think like, wow, that's really convincing. And then you realize, oh, he's talking about intellectualism and why it's wrong. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, fuck. But it's good because it's like, wow, this is such a convincing and plausible account of intellectualism that it almost manages to convert me before he's like, ah, no, not quite. Uh, we're going to have to look at it from a somewhat different angle. Um, and I really think that a lot of people could learn from that method because very few people are as capable of being critical uh, while being so charitable as Ponty. And it's kind of exhaustive, right? Uh, Deleuze writes in, uh, or he, he was writing a, an ode to Sartre, I think, after uh, Sartre died. And he kind of like hand waves Merleau Ponty for being too professorial and, <laughs> and writing kind of the way that you just said. Yeah. But... He, didn't, he didn't get the, uh, the oomph, the here's why this matters, the quippy lines, the things that people like about Sartre, but like, and, and this is obviously what, 600 pages, but it's so good. I think this oh, me yeah. method of writing is pretty brilliant, you know, building up the, the argument that you're then going to argue against. A lot, of, a lot of writers just sort of reference what they're arguing against and don't use the space that they're writing in to you know, actually set up exactly what they're going to argue against. And Ponty, Ponty has this brilliant way of doing that, of evoking and almost making you convinced by the thing that he's going to be, you know, talking yeah. about. And then, and then, he, and then lo and behold, he's like, actually, I have this totally other way of understanding things. You're like, oh, like it's, it's a really an interesting rhetorical strategy. Uh, I like, it. I haven't seen it since. <laughs> like he, he writes a sixth of the book on how great, Descartes is and then finishes up the section by saying how Descartes is like the worst philosopher that ever lived. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Anyway, great, great stuff. Um, so yeah, this is uh, part three of phenomenology on the pill pod. I also did some hour, I think they're like hour and a half long videos on, on it um, lectures while I was going through this book, but I, I, I'm enjoying it. So we should, uh, do a few more of these. Yeah, 100%. Let's do it. Let's keep it up. All right. This has been uh, PillPod 60-something. And uh, I will talk to you dudes later. Bye. Adios. Adios.